some special presentations. Uh, Arlan Sante, thank you very much. I thought he did an excellent job. Can we give him another round of applause? Just to give him a bit of that. Um, our first uh, guest speaker is uh, Dr. Andres Rodriguez. Uh, he's been a mentor of mine for quite a few years and I'm happy to have him here. And then the next uh, guest speaker is, is a friend of mine, uh, Peter Garcia, who is also part of our uh, team here at Western New Mexico uh, University. So with that, this, the show is yours, senor. Thank you, Dr. Bustamante. Kuali uh, Uali. Good evening. Anewa Nutoka. Andres Rodriguez. My name is Andres Rodriguez. Anewa Temastiani in Calmecac. I'm a professor at the University in New Mexico State. Anyway, uh, first of all, I'd like to start off by uh, sharing with you that I'll be talking a little bit about uh, ethnic identity, and then I'll be talking also about wholeness, and then I'll start touching on spirituality, and then at that point, I'll turn it over to Mr. Garcia, and then we'll continue with the presentation. Just to let you know a little bit about myself, I'm a native of uh, Grant County. I was born in Santa Rita, New Mexico, about 14 miles from here, and uh, my parents um, were also born in the community of Santa Rita. So my father and uh, grandfather and uncles were all minors there in Santa Rita, New Mexico. So growing up in that community, as some of you have heard stories about the mining community, uh, it was a mining community that was pretty much uh, racially divided. And, uh, there was uh, the discrimination there, there was the racism and so on. But uh, in spite of all that, I have a lot of wonderful memories growing up in Santa Rita. And uh, I guess the uniqueness about it was that uh, our parents and our families and our friends were very good at uh, insulating us from a lot of what was going on around us at the time. So uh, within our community, within our barrio, within the area where I grew up with my friends and cousins and so on, uh, there was a strong sense of community, camaraderie. Uh, just, uh, it was a good place to be at. There, there was a lot of joy, there was a lot of fun, and, uh, and um, I would never trade those experiences for anything else. But <clears throat> talking about my experiences then in school, which uh, I'm leading then from there on to a little bit of the Chicano movement, uh, one of the things that uh, I always felt that I was lacking or missing that was very important to me was a strong sense of, sense of identity. and. Uh, in, in, in the communities, even to this day, you will notice that there's a young kids, a lot of young kids, a lot of Mexicano kids, Chicano kids, and so on, and other groups of kids too, that are also 
looking for that sense of identity and uh, they're not finding it and, and whenever they find uh, some sense of identity they're finding it for example in the wrong places and they end up in trouble and so on but for me that was very important finding that sense of, of identity uh, and during the 1960s that was also one of the things that uh, individuals during the Chicano movement were looking for they were looking for that identity and we couldn't find it in school for example uh, in school uh, we didn't have Chicano studies like we do now and uh, I, you know I recognize you and uh, and applaud you for that for having it here at Western uh, we didn't have classes that have to do with cultura so there was a disconnect there was a disconnect between ourselves and and our roots and where we were and where we were coming from so for me that was very important and very important for others as well in terms of finding out who are we and where do we come from <clears throat> and where did this disconnect started taking place well if you ever read the work by uh, Bolfi Bataya uh, he's a Mexican anthropologist he talks about that notion of mestizaje and when we talk about mestizaje for the most part uh, for us it's biological it's the mixture for example the, the Spanish blood with the Indian blood and so on but according to Bataya that is not mestizaje, that is not mestizaje. for him mestizaje is the end result of the de-Indianization process is the end result of the ethnocide. The ethnocide that started taking place in the Mexican civilization back in 1521. That's when the ethnocide process started taking place and when the individual no longer, no longer considers himself indigenous. That's the final stage of the whole notion of mestizaje because at that point the individual no longer considered, considers himself indigenous, meaning that, that the, the Indian has already been taken out of the person. He's been de-Indianized or he's finally gone through the whole process of ethnocide. And, and that person, for example, uh, people that call themselves mestizos are, are what he calls are, uh, the individuals that have gone through the whole process of <coughs> mestizaje, ethnocide and, uh, and de-Indianization. Now, these individuals, for example, as far as the mestizo, is, is an individual that still, when you visit with him, when you talk with him, there's still a lot of the remnants, for example, of the, of the indigenous background. Uh, for example, they'll talk about the yerbitas, they'll talk about the curanderos, they'll talk about the sobadores, they'll talk about a lot of things that are still very indigenous, but they no longer consider themselves indigenous. In fact, it, it's been such a powerful thing that for any Mexicano to call himself Indian, to call himself Raramuri, to call himself, uh, say, Parumara, to call himself Olmeca or whatever, is a very hard pill to swallow for Mexicanos. And simply because the ethnocide process, the colonization process of the mind was so powerful and so strong that for many of them, it is very difficult, very difficult. So during this time period, a lot of Mexicanos were looking for roots, they were looking for identity, and they were looking for a way to decolonize themselves. Uh, <clears throat> how many of you have heard the, the, the parable of La, La Llorona? La Llorona. Most of you have heard La Llorona. Uh, can somebody just tell me of the version of La, La Llorona that you heard? Because all of you have heard about La, La Llorona in different versions, but it still has the same message. Uh, who would like to share one of the versions of La, La Llorona that you've heard? Nobody? Nobody wants to share? I'll okay, we've got one person. Let, let, let's hear your version. Uh, was the this way, La Llorona this way. Uh, our kids were crying and she kind of got upset with them and threw them into the river and they kind of went away with the river. She cries for them, that's what she cries for my night. Okay, so, so and typically that's pretty much the version of La, La Llorona. No matter, no matter what you've heard it, in, in the version of La, La Llorona that you've heard, for the most part, the, the mother is seen as, as the villain, as the culprit as the woman that, that uh, drowns the kids. 
But in life, just like in the indigenous philosophy, we're talking about dualities. In other words, there's always two sides to everything. So if we hear the version that is the indigenous version, you're going to hear a much different story. And that's what one of the things that I would like to do with you this evening is share with you the indigenous version. Now, in this particular version that I'm sharing with you, at the very beginning of the parable of La, La Llorona, you'll hear pretty much the same script. The script where La Llorona, for example, is the one drowning the kids. And after she drowns the kids, then she wails through the canyons and and wherever you know she's at looking for her kids crying for her kids because she drowned the kids that's what you're going to hear at the very beginning but then eventually it shifts over to the indigenous uh, version of La Llorona and this version of La, La Llorona I first became acquainted with a friend of mine that uh, and, and uh, were two good friends of mine that, um, that published it one time on a news, newspaper, and that's Roberto Gonzalez and Patri uh, Roberto Rodriguez and Patricia Gonzalez. So let me read to you this version. And again, you know, it starts off with the version that most of you have heard, and then moves into the version that's the indigenous version, which gives you the other side of La, La Llorona, uh, not the culprit, not the villain. A native woman wails through the ancient streets of Mexico. City Tenochtitlan. Donde estarán mis hijos? Where is she and where did her children? Uh, where are her children? People ask. She's the woman who sired the children of a conquistador turned aristocrat who purportedly loved her. She wails every night because one day when his bride to be stepped off a European ship, he banished the native woman and her children from the city. This was at a time when Europeans did not consider native people human. Devastated, the native woman drowned her children in a nearby river. And since then, she wailed through the streets looking for her children. There are other older versions, but this is the most widely known version of La Llorona, the weeping woman. Some say it's but European lies, an effort to dishonor her and cast a stain upon the children. Even to, to this day, many people from the nearby villages and pueblos have existed long before Europeans came to the Americas, say that the story was invented, that she never actually drowned her children, that they were swept away by a raging river as she bathed them. All the versions agree that no bodies were, were ever recovered. That is why she wails, not because she drowned them, nor because she never, uh, because they never received a proper burial, but because they may still be alive. Today, if one goes downstream, people report an occasional sighting and say that her screams can still be heard in the wind. Certainly her story hasn't been forgotten. For many centuries, she was seen as the culprit, but today, no one in the nearby villages see, sees her that way. Quite the contrary. They recount that it was she who cared for her children and that the conquistador cared about nothing except to slander her and the children. There are many stories about her, but there are many more stories about the children. It is said that they survived and left many tracks as they went from village to village looking for their mother. The same stories are heard throughout the continent, especially near bodies of water. This was during the years of war and famine, a time when conquistadores were laying siege to the countryside and were busy exterminating the continent, continent of its original peoples. During these years, the children were taken in and raised mostly by native mothers and grandmothers. Originally, they knew not, those, not who these brown children were, yet later they began to hear the stories spread by those who bore the swords. The mothers and grandmothers had their own children to raise during these difficult times, but collectively they cared for these lost children as best as they could. As best as they could. When these children grew up, they too heard the many conflicting stories. One story is that the children were actually the conquistadores and that the actual father was killed by him. Many of the villagers affirmed that the actual father never abandoned the children. 
that he was separated from them by the sword so that the conquistador could steal their beautiful mother. For many years, the children were rejected by all, treated as if they had been contaminated simply because they were born. The Europeans had spread rumors that she was but a woman of the streets and that her children were illegitimate mongrels. The native mothers and grandmothers who took them in knew not the word illegitimate. They raised them to, to love their mother and themselves. Yet even the children also began to believe the stories that they had forgotten who their mother actually was. The more they heard the false stories, the more they despised her. Eventually they rejected the mothers that raised them, rejected their teachings, rejected themselves, and eventually they even turned on each other. Despite this, the native mothers and grandmothers accepted them, especially when the children would not accept themselves. Nowadays, it is said that it isn't La Llorona who is looking for her children, but her children who are looking for her. In later years, there were many other lost children like them, despised and rejected by all. It is said that today one can see them braving the mountains and deserts and even crossing rivers, still looking for their mother, a place to call home. It is said that if they ever find their mother, no matter how long they have denied her and denied themselves, if they honor and come to her in a good way, that she will always embrace them and that they will always have a home. So in essence, what we're talking about is that the children were, for example, and still are, those that are looking for identity. That they have been disconnected from their mother, the mother being Mexico, their mother being the indigenous uh, side of, uh, of the individual. And uh, so this, this was pretty much what uh, a lot of Chicanos in, during, the, during the time were doing. We're looking for identity, we're looking for their mother, including myself. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and, uh, and uh, in terms of uh, what I discovered, what I found, and, uh, and the implications for me, my life, and me as an individual, me as a person. So when I started uh, doing some of this research, I started, for example, reading uh, a little bit about Jack Forbes. And um, in, in terms of reading about Jack Forbes, I learned a little bit about the history, for example, of the uh, indigenous people in, say, in Mexico. And according to Jack Forbes, for example, we're looking at, uh, looking back uh, many years, uh, say anywhere from 10, 11, 12, 13,000 years to 40,000 years, we're, looking, we're talking about a nice age. A nice age that covered Canada and that covered most of the United States from east to west. Only the southern parts of the, what is called now the U.S. were maybe not covered by ice, meaning that during this, this time period, most of our indigenous ancestors and even the indigenous ancestors of individuals who, say, for example, were born in the U.S., no matter what part of the U.S., most of the ancestors came from south. In other words, came from what is now Mexico. And as I started receding, he says that most of the movement was from south to north because there were more people living in the southern part, so the movement was from south to north. Now, looking at Jack Ford and what he talks about too in terms of uh, Mexicanos and going back to the idea that I mentioned earlier that for many Mexicanos it is a very hard pill to swallow that they are indigenous, but now call themselves mestizo because of the ethnocide process. Uh, Jack Forbes says that uh, when you look at Mexicanos, that uh, about 90% of the Mexicanos have indigenous blood that runs through their veins. And then he also says that about 80% of the Mexicanos, 80%, I mean, that's, that's quite a large number. He says that about 80% of Mexicanos more than 50% of the blood that runs through their veins is indigenous, is indigenous, more than 80%. Yet, you know, when you talk to most Mexicanos because of the ethnocide process being so powerful and so strong, when they talk about their ancestry, they're always gonna remind you about the, the Spanish grandparents and the Spanish uh, uh, grandmother and the Spanish great-grandfather and so on. Hardly ever will they say, you know, my 
indigenous grandmother, my indigenous grandfather, again because of the ethnocide process. Compared to, for example, individuals who are, say, European for the most part, and uh, they have ancestry, which could be Cherokee or whatever, could be a grandparent, they're very proud to tell you, you know, I have a grandmother the Cherokee. Because they never experienced the ethnocide process that Mekamos did. For Mekamos, it is very difficult. Very, very difficult. <clears throat> so in reading uh, uh, more of, in terms of Jack Forbes, he also talks about the, the Mexica. He talks about uh, Mexica leaving a place called Astalan. And uh, uh, the Mexicas leave Astalan in the year, we think, you know, looking at many historians, probably 1064. And when we think about Astalan and, and researchers trying to pinpoint Astalan, we really don't know where Astalan is at. Some people uh, pinpoint it somewhere in Mexico. Uh, some people say, well, this, it could be uh, here in, in the U.S., you know, as part of the Four Corner areas. But we really don't know where Astalan, Astalan was. But we do know that the Mexitin, the Aztecs, left Astalan around 1064. And Astalan for them was, was, uh, was paradise, believe it. It was paradise for them. It was a place where uh, there was peace, there was respect, there was joy, there was love, there was harmony and balance. I mean, there was abundance of many different things. But then people ask, you know, why would they want to leave something like that? In the philosophy, in the philosophy, everything that exists is life. Everything that exists is life. Meaning, if we look at the Mother Earth, the Mother Earth then is alive. Because everything is life. And, and being that the Mother Earth is alive, then the Mother Earth, then if it's alive just like we are, must have a soul. Must have what we call a navel. The navel for the, for the, for the Mexican indige indigenous uh, society or people or clans or groups or so on is your center, it's your core. And at the very core, at the very center of who you are, you find happiness. At the very center or the very core of who you are, you find love, you find beauty, you find joy. Now they, they found that within themselves when they were in Astalan. But for them then, it was a very important to find then the navel of the Mother Earth so that they could then develop their own community there within the navel of the Mother Earth. So that was very important for them. That's why they left because they found their navel and they were connected to it, but now they wanted to then create this beautiful community, another Astlan, a twin to Astlan, a beautiful community that would be a reflection of Astlan, but at the navel of the Mother Earth. So they left. And we think it probably took them about 260 years bef before they were able to find Tenochtitlan, the place where they ended up developing their own community. So during this time, they experienced uh, many, many different uh, problems, and they sacrificed a lot, but they never gave up. They never lost sight of their goal. They never saw, saw, lost sight of their mission. When they came into the Valley of Mexico, the Valley of Mexico was very well developed. I mean, highly civilized. Uh, they saw a civilization there that was beyond them. It's a civilization that started many years before that. A civilization that started, for example, uh, right off the coast of Veracruz to south of Veracruz by the Olmecs. The Olmecs started the civilization about 1800 BC. And that, that was the beginnings of the civilization of Anahuac. Anahuac, many people nowadays when the scholars and so on, you read about them, refer to Anahuac, not as Anahuac, but as Mesoamerica. But Anahuac is a name that's been around for a long time. Mesoamerica didn't need to be renamed. It was, it's already had a name. 
and the name has been Anahuac, which is the land between the waters. So Anahuac really extends from what we would call maybe the southwestern part of the U.S. all the way to the very southern tip of Nicaragua. That was Anahuac. That was Anahuac. <clears throat> so uh, the early beginnings of the civilization start then in, with the Olmecs. And then the civilization then started spreading out to other parts of Mexico, into the central part, and to the southern part, in the Yucatan Valley, in the Yucatan, uh, for example, Peninsula. In the Yucatan Peninsula, then you started seeing the civilization developed, the continuance of it with the Mayas. And moving inward, for example, uh, into the middle part, say the Valley of Mexico, then you started seeing the development of the Teotihuacanos. And then after the Teotihuacanos, then Tula, for example. Tula was like about uh, 200 uh, uh, AD when Tula, for example, uh, people in Tula left Tula. Uh, Teotihuacan was before that. Teotihuacan was, uh, uh, was BC. Uh, and the same thing with the, uh, with the Mayas. They started developing their civilization about uh, 1,000 BC. So, and these are just a few of the groups there were many, many other groups that were part of this whole civilization and learning from each other, sharing with each other, and expanding and getting the civilization to continue to grow, grow and to flourish and to develop into one of the greatest civilizations. In fact, when we're looking at this civilization that developed in Mexico, we're talking about an original, original civilization. See, other civilizations throughout the world existed but because they were looking at other civilizations and then creating their own from there. The civilization in Mexico is original, original. So when the Mexicas then come into Mexico and identify this island in a murky island, this marshy island, island that nobody wants to live at, that's infested with snakes in, 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 within this particular lake, Lake Texcoco, uh, this was the year 1324 when they identified the place where they wanted to develop <laughs> their own city, Tenochtitlan. So this was way afterwards. But the, the Mexicas were also very ingenious, very creative, and they learned from the people around them. They learned because what they wanted to do was then to develop a city that, that resembled the beauty, the elegance of what they had already been a part of in Astla. So again, you know, uh, nobody wanted to be a part of that particular uh, uh, island because uh, it was so uninhabitable. Because again of the snakes and it was marshy and it, it, it stunk and, and you know, who would want to live there? But being that they were very ingenious and very creative with a strong will, they created what uh, Many Spaniards that saw the city that was developed when they saw the city of Mexico, Tenochtitlan, as probably the most beautiful city in the whole world. And many of these Spaniards had been all over the world, had seen some of the <coughs> most beautiful cities in the world. But when they saw Mexico, Tenochtitlan, hands down, a lot of them said, the most beautiful city in the whole world. So they did create Aztlan also, you know, a twin of Aztlan. Uh, what I would like to do is uh, read to you an excerpt from a book by Jimenez and, uh, regarding the Aztec calendar. And he describes Mexico Tenochtitlan uh, in his book, and that's what I would like to read to you, a description of what Mexico Tenochtitlan probably looked like and probably resembled when the Spaniards first came in and saw it with their own eyes. Long ago, there was an abundant, or there was an enchanted land where deer frolicked on rolling meadows with manicured flower beds under graceful willow trees. Birds of many sizes and bright plumage soared from the branches where squirrels played. All of the animals were tame. The climate was always mild. The sweet scent of flowers and varieties of ripe fruit hanging from carefully attended trees perfumed the air. Butterflies filled the sky, waterfalls and streams fed fountains and ponds with brightly colored fish. Handsome brick houses, smooth tiled streets, 
and dramatic carved temples of solid stone mingled with sweeping vistas of lush beauty. Devoutly religious, the people were humbled before the eyes of their spiritual powers. These God-fearing souls were governed by eight guiding commandments given to them by their supreme creature. Missionaries would go out and convert the unenlightened. They gave thanks for their bounty. Theft was unknown. True wealth was measured by a person's charity. The poor, the old, the crippled were provided for. Hospitals were available to everyone and would charge. Citizens wore the model of cleanliness, bathing daily, sometimes twice. For leisure pleasures, they read books, listened to musical orchestras, or marveled at jugglers and acrobats. Birdmen soared above the heads of amazed spectators at the festivals. Intellectuals and philosophers bested each other in poetry and, and the natural sciences. The universities turned out architects, engineers, artists, sculptures, accountants, scribes, as well as the finest of the breed to manage their grand cities. The chief spokesman was chosen based on ability by a council of experienced leaders. A full complement of serv uh, civil services kept the bustling metropolis running smoothly. A medical profession, far advanced in herbal medicine, tended to the needs of the population that has swelled to 50 million citizens. At the markets, the quality and quantity of goods was so vast to shop took days. Lumber, concrete, plaster, glass lenses, bronze bells, fine linen, emeralds, gold, and jade could be purchased along with roast turkey. Broiled swordfish, tomatoes, avocado, cigars, wine, hot chocolate, flavored ice were also available. People lived and governed for the goodwill of all. They were considerate of the earth. Most everything was recycled, and there was little waste. The well-constructed roads had rest stations for passers-by to relieve themselves. The bridges, the dams, and dwellings were built with precision and definitive quality. They understood that the sun was another star. Uh, what I'd like to do next is show with you some, uh, some photos that uh, that uh, I've got here on, on the slides to just give you an idea in terms of uh, the, the civilization itself. Uh, first of all, you see uh, one of the colossal heads. It's an Olmec colossal head, and uh, they, they were known for for for, uh, for sculpture, sculpting these colossal heads. And talking about the Olmecs again, this is the, as far as we know the beginnings of the civilization, the Olmecs, 1800. And then moving on to the next slide, here you see. Uh, an example of the Mayan and, uh, and uh, a Mayan, for example, uh, Teocali here. Um, again, the Mayans, for example, were very much a part of the early civilization in Mexico. And here's Teotihuacan to the north of Mexico. Uh, I don't know if you've been to some of these uh, uh, places, but uh, I've been myself to, to some of these places and you can feel just the energy, just very powerful energy within these places themselves. Teotihuacan, and here's uh, Tula, Mexico, not too far from Teotihuacan either, also uh, north from uh, Mexico as well. And uh, uh, for example, the uh, Toltecs were the, uh, the, the, the group of uh, individuals who were a part of, uh, of uh, creating this community of Tula. And then here you see a model of Tenochtitlan, which is what I was talking about and referring to. And uh, it's just, just a model because if you were to go to Mexico, in Mexico, you're no longer going to see the lake because Mexico, the city itself, is built on top of this lake. In fact, if you go there, you see a lot of the buildings in downtown Mexico, and a lot of them have been sinking for a long time. Palacio de Bellas Artes and the many other ones have been sinking for, for, for a long, long time. But anyway, uh, let me go back just a little bit to the, uh, to the pr prior uh, slide. <clears throat> and looking at the... Uh, Tenochtitlan, uh, some of the things that I wanted to point out, this, this, this city was built in this lake. And so in other words, it meant that uh, during this time period, it grew real fast, it was a beautiful place, but then there were problems then that they, that they faced, that they, were, that they encountered as they, as they expanded. And one of the problems that they encountered, for example, was water. For example, they needed fresh water in, in the city itself, so a couple of things that they did is, uh, first of all, they knew of some springs of water that were located there in uh, Chapultepec, in the hills of Chapultepec, there was a spring. So then they built these aqueducts 
coming from the hills of Chapultepec in across, across the lake into the city of Tenochtitlan, which spanned approximately three miles in length. And what they did is they built two aqueducts, uh, and they were about uh, a little over five foot in, in terms of width. And the reason they built two aqueducts because they would then run the water through one aqueduct into the city, and then the other one was being cleaned at that time. So once that one was cleaned, then they would switch over and then run the water through the, uh, through the other aqueduct. Well, the city continued to grow and then they had more problems with water again. So that meant that, that they had to tap into another source in terms of uh, an aqueduct system. And then the next aqueduct system that they built was coming south. Coming south, again, about three miles and tapping into a spring of water and doing pretty much the same thing. Uh, so that solved the problem with water. Another problem that they had that they had to solve was with flooding. You know, this lake sometimes would flood tremendously and it, would, it could create a big problem for the city itself, you know, being there in, in the middle of this lake. So they had to do something about controlling, you know, the floodwaters and so it, it wouldn't just, you know, just uh, take over the, the city itself. So uh, one, of, one of the elders, Nessa Valcoyoten, uh, was the architect in developing and creating or building this huge dike that ran across the lake 10 miles long, a dike 10 miles long across the lake. And the, re the purpose for that dike was that whenever they had floodwaters, the floodwaters would be kept away from the city of Tenochtitlan and, and be kept away. For example, the dike could have been built like that to keep, to keep all the floodwaters away from, 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 uh, from the lake itself. Uh, the city itself uh, was built with wide, wide avenues, very similar to what you would find at the Otihuacan, just huge avenues, cleanliness, clean, clean avenues. Uh, uh, another, another thing that they had to do there was as the city started to grow, I mean, there was nowhere to grow because, I mean, they're in the middle of this, this island, but again, their ingenuity, uh, what they started doing then, okay, they needed more food, so what they started doing was that they were creating uh, ch uh, chinampas. And the, and the chinampas basically were, uh, in, in this case, were, were like, uh, like starter plants, like when you go to the, say, Walmart or whatever, buy starter plants. These were, st these were plants that, that would float in the water. And that's how they would then get uh, some of their food. And they also built chinampas uh, with, uh, say, with uh, timber and some uh, reeds, you know, t uh, connecting the timber, tied to the timber, grass on top of that, dirt on top of that, and then they would build some, some homes on, on top of the, the chinampas that were floating, for example, in the, in the lake. But one way that they would hold them in place was that they would then grow these large trees to anchor the chinampas, and the trees would then root in the bottom of the lake and hold the chinampas in place. So they were very, very ingenious. So what you would see here, a lot of the streets in Tenochtitlan were pretty much like Venice, water, you know, between, between, the, between the streets. And you would see a lot of boats coming and going into the, the, into the center of the city. So again, a lot of ingenuity, uh, a very beautiful city, very clean. Uh, to the north of Tenochtitlan uh, was the other island, Tlatelolco. And at Tlatelolco is where they had a big, big or huge marketplace where the Spaniards said when they first saw the market that it was beyond their eyes because there were literally just thousands of people, thousands of people in the market buying and selling and, uh, and just about anything that you could think of was available at the market for sale. And people were very, very orderly, extremely orderly. Uh, you can go to the next one now. Thank you. And again, you know, here's another painting of, uh, of what um, some individuals think that the, the center or the central part of uh, Mexico Tenochtitlan looked like. Uh, we, we only visualize uh, what it looked like because, as many of you know, what happened in, in 1521 when the Spaniards came in and invaded uh, Mexico, I mean, uh, much of this was destroyed. Much of this was destroyed. Uh, so in terms of, uh, uh, of, of, of advances, for example, advances uh, were in many different areas, for example, agriculture, you know, as I mentioned, for example, the, the chinampas and so on, 
uh, crops that they, that they were growing were, for example, corn, which was introduced by the Mexican civilization to the world around 5000 BC. Uh, pumpkins, uh, different varieties of beans, uh, squash, chili, avocados, amaranth, uh, cocoa, uh, tobacco, casseroles, you like pipian with uh, Chilean tomatoes and ground squash seeds, uh, cotton tomatoes, peanuts, cashews, bell peppers, popcorn, barbecue, allspice, salt, turkeys. Uh, I mean, the food, just the list just goes on and on and on and on. In fact, when you look at the contribution in terms of foods that came from the Mexican civilization and the civilization in Peru to the world, gifts to the world and the foods that we consume, uh, according to research, probably about 70% of the food that we eat throughout the world had its origin in either Mexico or Peru, in fact most of it from the Mexican civilization, from Anahuac, from Anahuac, most of it. So they, they were very, very advanced in many different areas, you know, just uh, in terms of medicine, in terms of dentistry, in terms of uh, Mathematics, you know, the, when we look at the uh, contributions to the world and the concept of zero, only two civilizations in the history of the world introduced the concept of zero to, to, to mankind. And one was uh, uh, the Mayas and also uh, the other civilization was uh, the Hindu civilization, were the only two civilizations in the world that, that introduced the concept of zero. Uh, place value is the, in the mathematics is something that they were using for for many years, hundreds of years, even before Europeans, for example, were using, uh, thought about uh, place value. Uh, but in Mexico, Tenochtitlan was very common to, to, have, to see people there using soaps and shampoos and air conditioners and hair rinses, deodorants, mouthwashes, toothpaste, toothbrushes, detergents, insect repellents. I mean, the education in Mexico, Tenochtitlan, uh, was, com was a compulsory education for all kids for all kids, pre-European times, education for all kids, regardless of wealth or so on, which, I mean, when we look at education here in the United States, when uh, Europeans first started coming over to the United States, education for the most part was only for boys, rich boys, white boys. Whereas in Mexico, way before that, hundreds of years before that, it was for all kids, education for all kids, compulsory education. So they had books, they had uh, uh, a, a, a lot of materials that they used, for example, in their schools and in education. They were destroyed, they were burned during the, uh, during the invasion. So a lot of this was lost. Uh, not everything was lost because if everything had been lost, we wouldn't be here talking about these things. So there were some beautiful things that were never lost. and. Uh, Mr. Garcia is going to talk about that. A lot of that has to do with just uh, our way of life, uh, our philosophy, which is one of the things that Cuauhtémoc uh, mentioned to the, uh, to, to the people in Tenochtitlan when the city was burning, when everything was being destroyed. He told him that everything's being destroyed, all the material things are being destroyed. But he told him about the philosophy that was very much a part of the Anahuac, to make sure and take those treasures in their hearts and hold them close to their heart and share them with their kids and grandkids and so on. So a lot of this knowledge, a lot of this information went underground for many years, for hundreds of years. And it didn't start surfacing into the open until after 1949. And that's when the body of Cuauhtémoc was exhumed in Central Mexico. And the, and the purpose of, the, of exhuming Cuauhtémoc was to see if, in fact, that was Cuauhtémoc, because Cuauhtémoc was tortured by the, uh, by the Spaniards, by Cortés, and, and, uh, and, and, and killed. And uh, he was burned. So when they exhumed the body, uh, just to identify, or just to make sure that, in fact, that was Cuauhtémoc, a lot of the elders said, that Guatemoc had returned, and now it's time to start sharing a lot of this knowledge, a lot of this information with the world at large. Uh, so with that, well, I'd like to move on to okay, we're at the, at the next slide. Huh? Uh, <clears throat> on this next slide, for example, when we're looking at the calendar, uh, the calendar is many, many different things, many different things. Uh, when I look at the calendar, there's history there. 
I look at the calendar, there's mythology there, there's philosophy, there's uh, science, there's math, there's art. I mean, there's hundreds of things within the calendar. Uh, for example, when I look at the calendar and I'm looking at history, at the very top of the calendar, this one? Can you hear me? No. What was it now? So, in, in looking at the calendar, looking at this uh, glyph right over here, looking at the glyph right over here at the very top of the calendar, that's, uh, that's a historical mark right there. And uh, the glyph right there is Matlaki Wanye Akat. Matlaki Wanye Akat. 13 Reed. And the significance of 13 Reed is that 13 Reed is the year 1479. And 1479 is the year that the calendar was put together in Tenochtitlan. Now, there's, there were other calendars before this one, you know, that, that started when the Olmecas and developed and created, but this particular calendar was put together in 1479. Another thing, too, that you see in the calendar that's uh, of a significance in terms of history is this glyph right here. There's a dot, and then you see the, the tekpat. You see the flint right next to the dot. And what that means is one flint. Setekpat. Setekpat. One flint has, has many different meanings. One flint represents the year 1064. You know, years repeat themselves every 52 years. Those are the cycles. Every 52 years, these names repeat themselves. But 1064 is significant. As I, when I was talking earlier in the conversation with you, that's when I mentioned that most scholars believe that the Mexica, the Mexitin, left Astalan in the year 1064. So that is one of the, that is very significant there. Another thing that is very significant with the year uh, Setakbat is the year 1324. 1324 is when the Mexica came to the Lake de Xcoco, and we're looking at the island, at their future home. And, and that's when they had decided that they were going to build their future home, but they had to wait for a very powerful cosmic event. So they had to wait till the following year, and they waited for Zenith to take place. When Zenith, when the sun, it has its most powerful rays, its mo most powerful energy shining its light on the, 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 the belly button or, or the navel of, of the, the Mother Earth. And the navel being, for example, that island that they were looking at, and, and, and to them that was the navel because they had seen many signs there that, that told them that that's where, where they needed to develop the, their city. One of the signs that they saw there was that the, there was an eagle perched on the, on the, on the nopales, and then there were the, the tunas growing from there. So the, the, the eagle, for example, is a metaphor for, for the spirit, for the spirit. And the nopal, for example, again, the metaphor for, say, uh, for, the, uh, uh, for, for, the, for the mother earth, for, for the land and all the hearts that were growing out of the, the, the nopal, which were the tunas, were all the hearts growing out of the mother earth. So here, there was a union, there was a union between body and spirit coming together, body and spirit coming together. Another thing too is that uh, the outline of uh, the Tashkoko, Lake Tashkoko, the outline, if you look at the outline, the outline of uh, Lake Tashkoko is very similar to the outline of a rabbit, Tatoshli, Toshli, very similar. And, and the Toshli is very important, for example, to the, to, to the Mexica because the, the Toshli, for example, they, when they would look at the skies, and look at the cosmos, and look at the moon, their mother, the moon, their connection to the moon, but they always saw, they always saw a figure on the moon. And the figure that all, they always saw on the moon was the figure of the Toshli, the rabbit, the rabbit. And going back to mythology, the rabbit ended up on the moon uh, after, uh, 
after one of after their four four sons or four worlds prior to theirs had already disappeared. Okay? And I'll talk about these four sons and four worlds that are right here. These four right here. But anyway, what happened is that there had been four worlds mythology, okay, prior to theirs, and theirs was the fifth son. And they had disappeared, they had been destroyed. And a lot of it had to do with imbalances that they themselves had created. Lack of harmony, imbalances, destroyed these four other worlds, these four other sons. So for them it was very important in their, in their philosophy to maintain a balance, to maintain harmony, to recognize the dualities, but to always find that balance within the du dualities, always looking for that harmony within the dualities. So, uh, <clears throat> so what happened here is that after these four worlds, the, the world was black, just black. There was just total darkness, and they needed light. They needed a sun to give them light, to give them direction, to give them warmth. So, so the elders got together in Teotihuacan, Tezacoa, uh, Tezcalipoca, and some of the other elders got together, and they called in a couple of individuals. And what they did is that they built this huge fire. And what they wanted to do then was to see which, uh, have one of these individuals jump into the fire and convert himself into the sun. So they called the very first one, the very first one, the, one of them was called Tecusitecat, and uh, I can't remember what the other one was, but they, 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 uh, they, they called the first one. The first one was uh, an individual that came from nobility, uh, a person that was a good looking person and so on. And they asked him to jump into the fire and then he would be the sun and he would shine on them and be their fifth sun. So he looked at the big old fire, just huge, huge flames, just, just, just huge, huge. And then he took off running towards the fire and then the heat just hit him and then he says, I can't do it. And he tried it three different times. He says, no way, that thing was too hot. So then they called the other guy to, to try it out, and the other guy was uh, came from a very poor family, was not the best looking person in the world, and they asked him to try it. He saw those huge flames, he started running, boom, jumped into the fire, became the sun. And he lit them up, the mythology. Yeah? So then the other one says, man, if you could do it, I want to do it too. So he ran, he jumped into the fire, and all of a sudden they have two sons. He says, no, we can't have two sons. So we need to put one of them out. So in the mythology, what they did is one of them grabbed a rabbit, a toshli, and threw it at one of them, turned it off, and that's why we have the moon with a toshli printed on it. So I thought I'd share that with you. But the mythology also, talking about these four blocks right here, these are, the four, they, these are signs of the four other suns that had been in existence prior to our fifth sun. The fifth sun is represented here in the middle. And this is called the Naui, Naui Ori, the Naui Ori. Now, <clears throat> so I see mythology, I see some history there. I also see, for example, in terms of uh, the philosophy, I see the dualities there in, within the calendar. And the dualities, I see them here uh, with uh, Osebo and Guatli. Osebo and Guatli. Those are dualities. Ocelot is a jaguar. Quatli is the eagle. Now, in terms of the dualities, which are very much important to the philosophy, you know, to find that harmony, to find that uh, balance between the, between the two, in, in the philosophy, everything is one. Where everything is one. In other words, everything that exists is interconnected. Everything that exists is interrelated. Oneness, wholeness. And, and one of the things that, uh, that we have within ourselves is that we all have energy, we are all energy, but that energy then is two. Because part of the energy that is within ourselves, within everything that exists, is feminine, and then there's also masculine energy. 
And every individual, everything that exists is energy and it's both energies, masculine energy and feminine energy. I'm talking about energies, okay? So when we look at the ocelot and we look at the quantity, the ocelot, for example, is known for its feminine energy. When we look at the quantity, quantity is known for its masculine energy. Now, if you look at the ocelot, the jaguar, and the, uh, the jaguar is nocturnal, whereas the quadli hunts during the day. So you see the dualities there too, day and night. Okay. Now the ocelot, for example, when he hunts, he hunts very cautiously, very cautiously, very meticulously. He takes his time, and then he pounces on his prey. Feminine energy. The masculine energy, that of the eagle, the eagle is very direct. I mean, he just soars in the sky, sees his prey, poof, direct, direct. Masculine energy. Now, in terms of us, in terms of the philosophy, in the philosophy, we are both masculine and feminine energy within ourselves. Meaning that in life, you know, understanding that we have these two different energies to help us live a better life. In many cases, we rely too much in just one of them, when in some situations, maybe the other energy would work better. In some cases, we use the direct energy of the quantity, when in some cases, maybe <coughs> diplomacy and the jaguar might be more beneficial. So just, just, under, the, us developing that understanding that we are both. And those dualities, you also see them down here at the bottom. Right here and right here. At the very left, you see Tezcatlipoca, and at the right, you see, right here, you see Quetzalcoatl. Two different energies. When we're looking at Quetzalcoatl, I mean Tezcatlipoca, Tezcatlipoca is our internal self. Our internal self. It's a what is our outer self. So meaning that in life, it is very important for us to balance ourselves. And many times in our society, in our lives, we have very little time for this kind of boca, for our inner selves. And, and balance is very important. Harmony is very important. So for the Mexica then, and for the indigenous, people say from Anahuac, it was very important to maintain that balance and find that time to where we can just reconnect with our inner selves and be in tune with our inner selves. And that's the Skadi uh, Let's see, uh, right here we see uh, Olin. Olin, this symbol right here, this cliff, that's Olin. Uh, Olin, when I look at Olin, Olin, is uh, it connects me with life. It connects me with life. Olin, the, the, uh, the symbol of Olin is like two half circles like this. And then continue to the state. And one of the things I wanted to mention was um, in the exhumation of Potemok's body, the Nahuatl peoples revealed that they had his body the same di same exact day that the Hopis revealed, the Hopi prophecies, which they had kept secret from the time of uh, Spanish encounter. And it was also um, the anniversary date of the Pueblo Revolt when the Pueblos of uh, the Southwest rose up against the Spaniards, which Pueblos are quite proud to say was the only successful rebellion of indigenous people against uh, any of the conquerors. That connection, has existed between Native peoples in North America and Mexico from the time of, um, well, pre-Columbus. You know, one of the things that um, I wanted to share with you was I don't know if you ever had the opportunity to meet uh, El Maestro Andres Segura. I heard about him from Andres, but I never met from Andres. Um, Andres Segura um, was a maestro who was uh, Capitan General of the Concilio de Concheros, which were the traditional uh, danzantes that kept the Mexica tradition, and he could trace his 
spiritual life, for lack of a better word, and his uh, family life, seven generations before the conquest. To show the continuity that he had, he had a um, piece of jade that was middle, middle formative Olmec, uh, which would be 1500 BCE, and said the story and knew he could trace it back to nine maestros before he got it. Before that, he didn't know their names. You know? so there, I mean, there's been this continuity. In talking about the identity, we have to look at the resistance to help to Indian people keeping their identity. You know, we know about the conquest, I won't revisit that, but I will revisit some of the um, atrocities to suppress spirituality that did occur. I'll just give you generalities, but then I'll give you a specific story because it ties, relates back to uh, contemporary indigenous spirituality. The, um, the Sundance ceremony, which has become a pan-Indian ceremony now, it's practiced by you know, most tribes, including tribes from um, Latin America, tribes from Canada that didn't tra traditionally dance the Sundance, and uh, Chicanos. Chicanos in their search for an indigenous spirituality were invited by the Sundance tribes to come in and uh, begin to participate in the Sundance. To give you a brief description of the Sundance, it's a four-day ceremony where um, the participants fast from food and water, dance from sunup to sundown, and at some point during that ceremony, they will uh, pierce. So if any of you have seen the movie A Man Called Forest where the guy's hanging off a tree, that's the Sundance ceremony. And it's still practiced today, and it's practiced um, internationally, actually. You know, tribes in Mexico have uh, accepted you know, the Sundance, they've adopted it, rather. They've adopted the Sundance in order to connect with the other tribes in North America. And so there's this pan-Indian movement that's happening. A lot of that resistance um, came, of course, from the religious oppression. You know, some of the elders talk about the Sundance being suppressed up until 1972, when the FBI came in with the National Guard to put, you know, to cut down the Sundance tree. Uh, some of the elders of the Native American Church talk about times when they would have to hike five miles into the woods and hide their ceremony. The Navajo, several Navajos who took the uh, Native American Church to the Navajo Reservation, spent time in Arizona prisons for practicing uh, their religion as late as 1953. Uh, the Supreme Court had to finally make a decision back in 91, I believe, um, regarding the use of peyote as a religious ceremony. You know, so Native peoples have not had the access to their religious practices, and yet they've held on to that tradition. They've held on to it in different ways. You know, mostly it went underground. Um, in an affirmation, talking about that ethnic identity when you were talking about the movement and the idea of the ethnic identity, I find it interesting, and the reason why I bring this up on the tail end of the suppression was that um, historically I think a lot of us are familiar with the idea of Wounded Knee and the original Wounded Knee, which was the massacre of Wounded Knee, when uh, several people were you know, slaughtered by the cavalry. What's not often noted about that massacre was that in fact the cavalry went to go suppress their practice of the ghost dance ceremony. Um, there's a famous photo of a chief who is um, dead in the snow with his hands clenched like this. And uh, nobody's ever made a comment. What the Lakota people say is that his uh, prayer pipe, which was, you know, and because he was a medicine chief, it was a very sacred prayer pipe was stolen by one of the cavalry after they found this man dead in the snow. Yeah, you know, so this is the attitude that was given towards native spirituality. In, night, in the mid-70s, I can't remember the day, but um, when the American Indian Movement had the second takeover of Wounded Knee, one of the interesting things about it wasn't just a political movement. One of the leaders of that movement was a man by the name of Leonard Crowdog, who was the son of a traditional uh, Lakota medicine man. He was also um, from a lineage of chiefs. And his line goes back to the original Crowdog, who um, historically 
And I've got to give you this background and give you all of this. Historically, the original Crow Dog killed a man by the name of Spotted Tail, who was the one who had arranged for Crazy Horse to be killed by the cavalry. So in retaliation, Crow Dog killed Spotted Tail. The Treaty of Fort Laramie um, determined that all criminal matters would be handled by the tribe itself. And so the council determined the Crow Dog had acted on behalf of the tribe, therefore uh, his punishment was that he could no longer carry weapons and that his family couldn't carry weapons. And so from that point on, they were deemed to be medicine people because this would be the only way for them to be able to support themselves economically. The, um, Indian agent wanted to insist that he be tried for murder. And so he was, in fact, um, indicted for murder. But they didn't have the authority to arrest him and you know, take him out to, uh, he had to go to Pierre, South Dakota from the Rosebud Reservation. It was the middle of winter. This man got on his horse and traveled eight days in a blizzard to make it there in time for his court here. Um, the news had covered it to such a point that Congress had to, in fact, act on this idea of um, the tribes would have jurisdiction over their own people. And so with that, they passed the Major Crimes Act, which gives the federal government authority over the major crimes that occur on Indian reservations. The reason I bring this up isn't so much to give you a sense of history, but a sense of soul. To talk about spirituality amongst Indian people, you have to talk about the soul. You know, spirituality is really, spirit is really a limited term. Um, spirituality is a major aspect of religion, but it's not religion. Soul is a major aspect of spirituality, but it's much more than that. Soul also encompasses the way that a community interacts with itself at a deeper level than just you know economic relationships or social relationships. It's a means of um, refining yourself and finding yourself within that soul. One of the things that um, you had started off with was the idea of the mestizaje. And the idea that in lots of parts, you know, I mean, we have a process of acculturation happening through the mestizaje, but at the same time, we have a adherence to tradition you know, Benito Cordova, a um, um, scholar who looked at the cultures of northern New Mexico, in fact, termed that, um, that aspect of the mestizaje, where it still holds onto the traditions, where it still has some aspect of the tradition, he refers to that as henisimismo. Uh, and the idea of the henisero actually being a detribalized um, Indian. His prime example is the village of Abiquiu, which is primarily a uh, northern New Mexico, for lack of nomenclature, you know, just, we'll call it Hispanic, you know, just to be safe. The village of Abiquiu has a morada, you know, the morada, of course, is the chapel of the penitentes. Interestingly, when you go into the morada, right before the altar in the morada, there's a hole in the ground, which, they tell you very directly is the Sipapu, which is the uh, place of emergence for Pueblo peoples from each of the preceding three worlds. We believe that this is actually the fourth world. They maintain that. Um, what Benito Cordova started looking at was in fact how indigenous values were still maintained within the Voltura. And that in fact these aspects, these traditional villages held on to that part of the cultura and adopted it and brought it in. One of the interesting things also is that um, in the villages they talk about their interaction with the Comanches. If you look at a uh, crucifix from uh, the San Santero tradition in northern New Mexico, you'll notice that the, uh, the Cristo has two wounds up here in his chest, which though nobody's actually stated it, I don't remember any part of my Christian teachings that Christ got stabbed in the chest. They sure look like Sundance wounds to me. 
And so in fact, what happened was the indigenous cultures ended up melding into the Hispanic culture and created a new mestizaje, or in this case, the Henerismo. And then add, you know what I mean. Um, to me, it's really fascinating. To me, it's really fascinating for myself. Which, excuse me for not introducing myself. Uh, among Indian people, that will be bad mannered. So let me step back here. My name is Peter Garcia. I have I am born to parents Armando Garcia, who is a uh, Mexicano de Chihuahua, and. Uh, Vera Teresa Sapiestewa, who is of the Sidecorn clan of Third Mesa. Uh, the Sidecorn clan is one of the water clans. And that was how they taught us. That's how we taught me. One of the things that um, we've maintained from that tradition is the idea that our spirituality is our life. It's also our value system. It's what teaches us our values. It teaches us what our relationship is. The idea of the Henisaro really fascinated me in that um, what happened was we had a culture that kept its archetypes. It didn't change. There's a priest by the uh, name of uh, Padre Luis Jaramillo who proposes that in all cultures that, he, uh, that myth is to culture what energy is to matter that myth is to culture what E equals MC squared. That the myth might change form, but it never changes. It changes shape, but it's, the impulse is always the same. His example of that is the idea of um, autophony, which is um, the academic term for the belief that we are born of the earth. The way that he uses this as an example is that uh, now we tell our children the stork brought you. Somehow we still maintain a relationship with nature, but we've minimized it. We've almost ridiculed it to a point of um, it simply being a fairy tale, you know, folklore, which speaking of fairy tales, I want to you know, make my commentary. I think fairy tales, unfortunately, have also been trivialized in our minds. I mean, there's a profound knowledge there that we, you know, should spend some time tapping into. Um, but in that same thing, also with that impulse, and looking at the spirituality, and really what I wanted to discuss was the cultural resistance part of it. Holding on to the curanderismo is an act of resistance. You know, in light of everything, you know, I mean, we can call it globalization, but in light of um, acculturation, we're also told which medicines we should be taking, and yet we know that we had such a base of herbal knowledge that it actually provided the modern medicines that we have. You know, Willow gave us aspirin, so why don't we just go use Willow? It's a little more trouble, but it's you know a lot cheaper. The um, and it ties us back to something. What happened after Wounded Knee Two? Back to where I started. That's what happens when you can't read your notes. What happened after Wounded Knee Two was that um, the American Indian Movement took up arms to try to make a point. They tried to occupy uh, this land that was, you know, for, for obvious symbolic reasons. And uh, somebody got shot, two people got arrested, and then with the COINTELPRO campaign by the FBI, I think the rough estimate is probably about 29 people killed by the FBI in um, their counterintelligence program against the American Indian Movement. At that point, um, the father of Leonard Crowduff, Henry Crowduff, called together all the traditional Lakota medicine men, and they met with these young radicals um, from the American Indian Movement, and they told them, you tried using their weapon. It didn't work. Use ours now. And what he meant was the pipe, the spirituality. And that spirituality was a counter to the hegemonic, um, well, you know, the spiritual hege hegemony, you know. The spiritual hegemony that had gone on. The boarding schools, we know, try to, you know, the ethnocide that happened with the boarding school experience to Native Americans, um, the ethnocide of the relocation, which, um, on a certain level, I'm, you know, 
of course, have my history with that, you know, the intergenerational trauma, which I'll touch on right now. But on the other hand, I'm kind of grateful because I'm here because of it. Being that my mother's family being relocated, she ended up marrying my father. Being that, unfortunately, where they had a stable relationship due to the relocation, they ended up becoming migrant farm workers. And, um, you know, I mean, where they were farmers themselves, farming their own fields, now her family has to go pick the food for other people. So aside from the cultural devastation, being that farming is the basis of uh, Pueblo culture, and in particular, Hopi culture, you know, I mean, that was stripped away from them, but also their economic base and their political base. They no longer had a home. You know, she began to wonder about her own identity because of her loss of home. You know, home was referred to now as outcome and she hadn't lived there since the age of seven. You know, but that was home. Um, the impact that that had in terms of intergenerationally is an interesting, and it's an, I have to explain the process. I mean, it's so much easier if I have a blackboard, but I need to think about it. So if you can visualize a tree, and in this tree you have the roots, and the tree represents the world that we all interact with. From those roots, which are the tradition that you're born to, you learn everything you need to know. As a child, I was told a story about a man who was arrested back in uh, the early 1900s by the cavalry and sent to Alcatraz Island for not allowing his children to go to uh, Indian boarding school. And in fact, the cavalry came in and took 37 men from uh, the Hopi village of Hopevilla and sent them to Alcatraz for seven years. Um, and yet, this man, I was told the story about this man, and um, he was, they, you know, they said well, it must have been horrible being there, and he just started, he just smiled, and he's going like, no, we have a word for ocean, and how many of us have ever seen it? I got to see it every day. Where does that sort of strength come from? Know? But what happens when you no longer have that source? And this is where the process of intergenerational trauma, you've taught these values, and then you're sent into the world that rejects your existence, ex rejects your identity, rejects your values. And so you end up retreating. And so it is an entire culture, an entire community ends up retreating further and not tapping into its roots because it's not giving them any values to go into this other world. Well, they carry some of those values with them, and they go back, and they send their children out into this world together, and they come in, and they have this other confrontation. And again, those children end up retreating further from the roots. And so you have this process of intergenerational trauma that you either end up breaking, you know, as you would take anything with enough tension and twist it, eventually it'll snap. Or you step out of the entire process and just leave it all behind. What ends up happening to those who break? You have entire communities of broken souls who have no connection to who they are. You know, again, we're not talking about the individual, and especially with indigenous communities, there is no sense of self. Um, and if there is, well then it's considered to be bad for them. You know, the other thing about uh, our indigenous value system, which was a sharp contrast with the uh, colonizing values, was that in the colonizing values, you have a duality of evil and good. In indigenous sensibility, you have simply balance and imbalance, respect and disrespect. You know, and if you're being disrespectful, well, then you can be brought back into balance. There's just something wrong with you. You know, all you need is a little bit of time and a little bit of care, and if you're just, you know, at some point, maybe you, you know, you don't want to, and then they just kind of leave you off to the side until you decide that you want to come back home. The, um, how do you, I mean, how do you contrast this with a culture that places its value on material gain and on personal accumulation versus a culture that realizes that its entire existence is based on its relationality. 
you know, the relationship to the earth is recognized as a necessary relationship. It's not a quaint notion of this is our mother earth. No, this is a notion and an understanding that everything we put into the earth returns back to us tenfold. You know, this is the gift of life. The relationship of um, all human existence, of all being, could best be exemplified by this notion of uh, male and female among Pueblo peoples in particular, including the Hopis, even though they try not to think of themselves as Pueblos. But the idea is that the earth is a basket and the sky is a bowl. And within this, you have complete protection. But it also speaks of the relationship of male and female contrasted with the Western notion of male being inserted into female, of male dominating female. No, the idea of male relationship to female is that yes, the male has to be the bull, has to be more durable because there's more that it has to do to protect. The male energy has to do more to protect what's within being held within the entire sphere of the male and female. It's a, it's a relationship of reciprocity as opposed to the relationship of accumulation. That needs to be explained before I go into what I'm about to talk next, which is um, primarily the cultural resistance. The cultural resistance wasn't just a political movement by Indian peoples. The cultural resistance was an understanding that they were fighting not only for their identity, but among traditional Indian peoples, they also know that someday they'll shut up long enough so we can teach them. And I've heard this from Hopi people, I've heard this from Pueblo people, I've heard this from Lakota people, I've heard this from people in Peru, I've heard this from people in Guatemala, and Chiapas, and Oaxaca, and Nayarit. The traditional elders who hold strongly to these particular traditions agree with the uh, comment made by, the, uh, by Edward Said when he uh, wrote that unless we defend particular cultures, distinct cultures, the next fall of civilization is going to make the uh, dark ages seem like the dresser or something. My argument for that is um, look at the sociology of the German sociologist George Simmel. He talked about the center and that the center does tend to be hegemonic because it is the dominant force. And in that, it's perpetuating itself with its value, its own values, its own skewed moralism of what is right. And its rightness then gives it, emboldens it to carry on with, you know, we'll go ahead and call it imperialist, hegemonic practices. What are, you know? Hegemony is homogenous. Hmm? Hegemony is homogenous. It's more than they're acculturalizing it. You said you weren't going to heckle me. <laughs> <laughs> you promised me. I know I break promises all the time. You know, so. Anyway, I can't remember what the hell I was saying. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> Uh, no, if, anyway, back to the center. And so it's going to spread. But what ends up happening is it eventually collapses. You know, it eventually collapses. And when that collapse happens, what alternatives do you have if, in fact, you have killed off all your alternatives? You know, we've seen this um, some time back in the scare with the corn blight that happened probably about 15 years ago. And that um, there was no native seed in the Midwest, and everything was a hybrid, and the corn blight came and took the entire hybrid out. You know, fortunately, we were able to, uh, you know, thanks to our negotiations with NAFTA, we were able to pull the corn out of Mexico and drive the corn prices in Mexico up, which, you know, then had its impact on the tribes in Mexico itself, which they, in fact, started to look at in terms of cultural resistance, but also economic resistance. The, um, there's a distinct need for that. Native peoples recognize that. That's why throughout my childhood, I always heard someday they're gonna shut up long enough to listen. 
What are the teachings we have? But an incredible support system. An incident that occurred that, um, I, I just, I don't know why I hesitate to say this, but it's a great story. I met a man in South Dakota who just met him like that summer, three months later, he's calling me up and telling me that his daughter's stranded in San Antonio and that um, he can't put her on the bus and he doesn't have money to fly her, he doesn't have any family, and he only has enough money to get himself to Denver. I was living in Silver City at the time. I told him, like I said, I just met the man three months prior, but I told him I would go to San Antonio and pick up his daughter. Called the friends of mine in San Antonio and told them what was happening. Could I stay there and then take off from there and figure out how to get her to Denver? Immediately, I mean, without, you know, hesitating or even discussing it, the man I'm talking to tells me, he said, well, my wife and I will drive her to El Paso, then you can drive her from El Paso. Uh, he calls me up an hour later and says, we're on our way. I picked her up in El Paso. Um, when in El Paso, I got a phone call from somebody in Santa Fe and I found out that she was, you know, that I was going to be traveling up to Denver. And they then told me, stop in Santa Fe and we'll drive her to Denver. We ended up getting the girl home to her father. We didn't know each other. The only thing we knew about each other is that we prayed together. And that that was enough. The only thing that little girl knew was that these men and women had prayed with her father. That's all she needed to know to trust us. This was a community that was developed out of this uh, spirituality. It was developed out of the movement. Um, in that, it's an expression of that resistance. You know, it's an expression of um, that tradition. And you mentioned La Llorona. And, you know, I was telling Gilda my story of La Llorona as a recent. And um, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about La Llorona in preparation for this. And for some reason, I had a notion that La Llorona was actually an archetype, as you mentioned, of, uh, of uh, cultural resistance. Taking La Llorona all the way back, past the indigenous stories, taking her to the pre-Columbian ideas, La Llorona is directly related to the goddess Siwakora who was a war goddess of the uh, Mexica. The descriptions of Siwakoa was that she was a beautiful woman who would travel the uh, roadways, and that often you would uh, encounter her at the crossroads, and she would immediately turn from being a beautiful woman to being this skeleton with a war shield and in full war regalia with a lance. She was understood to be a war goddess. She was also understood to be a river goddess. She was the mother of um, the god Mishkoa, who um, she abandoned because she had other business to tend to. And when she came back, he was gone. And what she found left behind were the obsidian blades that were used for human sacrifice. The people in Tenochtitlan said that um, they would find a woman running through the streets with a cradle board, and that the cradle board would be left behind in the cradle board. The, uh, one of the obsidian knives swabbed like a child. That really, that part of it spoke a lot to me, in particular in the original lyrics of the song La Llorona, which unfortunately I can't read them to you, so I'm going to have to paraphrase it. But the original verse of the original song La Llorona uh, is, I saw you on the steps of the temple in your Lupita. You were so beautiful, I thought you were the goddess. Yesterday, and you know, the next verse is, uh, Yesterday I was a man in full glory. Today I am but a shadow dying of cold at the river. Wrap me in your levoso, Llorona. They say the dead do not cry, but they cry. But no, they say the dead do not suffer but they suffer more because they cannot cry. So please cry for us, Yorona. As opposed to the contemporary version of La Yorona, something about Chile Verde and I don't know what else. You know, Picoso, you make more salvoza. You know, this song speaks directly to something that happened, the syncretism that happened. 
I'm not going to go into the whole thing. There's a whole other discussion as to uh, whether or not Guadalupe is in fact uh, the earth to us, Cotlicue. But there is a lot of correlation between Guadalupe's um, symbolism and Cotlicue's symbolism. And Tepayac happened to be the shrine of Cotlicue, so you, know, you can draw your own correlations from that. Personally, I'm a Guadalupe fan, so I hope to that one. The idea of Yorona, though, is that I want another story that Saogun says is that a woman ran through the streets before the fall of Tenochtitlan, that it was an omen of a woman falling running through the streets, crying, my children you will be lost and scattered, where will I find you? A story that I heard from um, El Maestro was um, that in fact, for four days before the uh, Spaniards came into Tenochtitlan, that the wind blew really strongly and that on the wind, you could hear a woman's voice, but it was inaudible. And only in the homes of each family could you hear what was going to happen to the entire family line once they were scattered, lost. That they were warned of who would die, they were warned of uh, who would be lost. And that she, in fact, was this goddess warning and loving their children. In Thinking about La Llorona um, and talking to people about La Llorona, I heard two very interesting stories. Now, this one speaks of, uh, particularly to me, of the cultural resistance aspect of La Llorona. She, uh, the Mayans of Guatemala tell the story of, uh, of the weeping woman. They tell the story of her in that she was a young woman whose son had, or whose husband, in fact, had been killed in the resistance against Pedro de Alvarado. She discovered that she was pregnant. In her pregnancy, she wanted to determine the destiny of her children, or of her child. You know, she wanted to know what the fate of her pregnancy was, rather. Right? So she went to one of the Mayan priests to uh, divine the fate of her pregnancy, who in fact told her that she was going to give birth to twins, and that they were the incarnation of the hero twins of the Popol Vuh, the Mayan creation story, the hero twins uh, the friars, according to the story, you know, caught wind of this. Um, and so 13 days after the birth of the children, these children were then taken from her arms by the Spanish soldiers and then taken away and taken north. She never knew where they went. She just knew that they went north. And so she wanders the waterways and the roadways looking for her children, similar to the Indian Stories, the indigenous stories of Bayerona. That part of it really speaks to me about the resistance and that there was a hope, a desire, um, you know, again, referring back to what Cornell West talks about, the hope in the face of despair, what he calls um, subversive joy. The happiness and the hope that you find in the face of oppression and continued oppression, knowing that you're somehow going to rise up above this is an old story. This is an old story that existed much longer, <coughs> way before the Spaniards came, and with their notion of the male-female relationship and the idea of patriarchy, imposed the Medea myth onto a tradition that existed among Indian people. And the Medea myth, of course, being the story that uh, Medea, who was jilted by Jason, uh, showed up at Jason's wedding, you know, even though she helped him, you know, dupe her father and brother to steal the golden fleece, he then rejects her because she's a barbarian, uh, marries a good Greek woman. She shows up at the wedding with a dress that, you know, catches the bride on fire and, uh, you know, and then she kills her children in front of the father. So this is a myth that really speaks about a patriarchy. Now, what we're talking about now isn't so much a mythology that's being imposed on people, but an entire ideology that's being imposed on people. Indigenous people were matriarchal. You know, now you have a patriarchy that's bringing in with it this whole other mindset, and it's bringing with it these values of individual accumulation. It's bringing with it these values of greed, I mean, you know, we'll just sum it up with one thing, with one word. 
we had a confrontation at this point of two cultures. Now, not as an apologist for you know what we would term the best desire, but just looking at the phenomenon of this. As Cuauhtémoc himself had said, keep the treasure secret. It was kept secret. It went underground. Many families in that process, again, through the intergenerational trauma, acculturated and stepped out of it. Many kept it. As broken as they were, they held on to it. Um, expressions of that holding on to those traditions. One of the things that I shared with Dr. Bustamante earlier was the story of working with a young woman who uh, wasn't able to get a job. She would go to the interview and she would never, you know, make it, never get a call back after the interview. Um, one day somebody suggested that she just take the candle of San Martin del Caballero, a glass of water and a piece of grass to feed the horse and burn the candle. And that San Martin was going to help her. Well, in fact, what happened was the next interview she went to, they offered her the job at the interview. Was it? San Martin's intercession? Yeah, it was. On what level? Probably on all of them. But somehow, something spiritual happened in that woman in going back to the tradition. A tradition that she didn't practice, but that she was familiar with. Somehow, grandmother, mother, Dia, maybe the woman who owned the panaderia, who knows, but she was familiar with that tradition enough for it to have a spiritual transformation in her. There was something that happened. In looking at indigenous spirituality, thinking about it, I was thinking about indigenous spirituality and I kind of like, all right, in education. And I'm like, I, I really don't know what that means because education itself is a spiritual act. You know, what does spirituality do for us except reconnect us with our soul, give us a new way of being in the world? It provides us with that sense of self. It provides us with that sense of connection. It gives us, it emboldens us in some way. To be able to pray within spiritual tradition connects you to a spiritual community. You know, aside from the practical things like getting your kid from San Antonio to Denver, um, it reconnects you in that you are now able to have that connection to family. You know who you are. The reclamation of a culture. Um, I saw a community that was reclaiming its indigenous identity. They were able to trace their lineage back to tribal roots. But now they're trying to redefine themselves through spirituality. A comment made you know, through the Pan-Indianism that they had adopted, which, primarily, which was specifically the Native American church, a comment that one of these men made was, now we have something to give to our children. They knew they belonged to a family, but they didn't know they belonged to a people. They didn't belong to the gringos. They knew they didn't belong to the chicanos. Now they know who they belong to. And now they don't need to fumble around and they can go forward with their own lives and do what they need to do as individuals because they have a foundation. That was really profound. That was incredibly profound. And from that impulse, throughout the Southwest, you have Native communities that are tapping back into the spirituality, creating uh, programs, tying the spirituality, tying the education, tying the tradition. Uh, one particular program that uh, Dr. Rodriguez and I were talking about was the uh, National Latino Father and Family Institute that has a series of curriculum. And, uh, but the basis of their curricula is two traditional values which they tie back to the Nahuatl tradition, but which is, you know, fits, you know, the Chicano tradition. And it's simply the concept of uh, palabra that a noble human being keeps their word. And the idea of uh, the indigenous notion of which is act in a way that makes your grandparents proud. By taking it back 
And I've seen the uh, result of giving this back to youth. The um, my travieso nephew there has picked up on this tradition. He's carried on with this tradition. Not only did he pick up on the uh, tradition of the Mexica danza, but he picked up on the tradition of the spiritual tradition. And in that spiritual tradition, he ended up learning the values from the old people that were still there, that were still teaching us those ways. The um, Right now, there's a big movement within the Native American church. One of the things that uh, excites me, being that you know, I am Chicano and I grew up in uh, Southern California, is that the major, I don't know what to call them, major players, the major, uh, the new generation of the Native American church, the major force of the new generation of the Native American church are young Chicanos. Young Chicanos in their 30s have taken over the Native American church and they're connecting, they're renewing it. They're, um, the older Native Americans are excited as hell to see these young Chicanos coming in and rejuvenating this tradition. Younger Indian people, because of these young Chicanos coming in, are uh, coming back in. There's a young man who, uh, actually I call him a young man because of the kid's size, but he's only a little boy, training. He's uh, Diné, um, the original peoples of the Navajo. From, he's Diné from Alberta, Canada. And I cracked down because, you know, I mean, one day this is one of these other younger Chicano uh, spiritual leaders, and I were looking at Frankie, he's going, man, I'll get it, dude. He said, well, he said, the Chicanos want to be Indians, the Indians want to be Chicanos. And so I guess this is what Vasconcelos was talking about when he was talking about La Raza Cosmica. We're all mixed up. The, um, in this connection with the Chicanos, the Chicanos have found an identity back to, into Mexico. They've connected back with the tribes of Mexico, the Huichol, the uh, Maya, the Mixtec, the Mazatec, the Huastec. The um, Chicanos now have a seat on the International Indian Treaty Council because of their relationship to the Native Americans and uh, indigenous people throughout the Americas. The, Native, or the International Indian Treaty Council gave Chicanos a seat using the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo as recognition of Chicanos as an indigenous people. Chicanos now, through that affiliation, Chicanos also have a seat at the um, UN's Indigenous Human Rights Council. It speaks about a spirituality that ties back to the political. Again, in talking about indigenous communities, the spiritual, the educational, the political, the economic, um, they're all connected. You know, it's all a connection. The story and looking at Mayorona and looking at her archetype of how she was, in fact, syncretized. Looking at the syncretism of La Llorona, I overlooked a very distinct um, story that, I'm gonna go ahead and warn you, if I start crying like a baby, please forgive me. 30 years after uh, Pedro de Alvarado had conquered the Maya of Chiapas, there was a revolution led by a man by the name of Canek. Um, the Spaniards went to this area in Chiapas on the Umasinto River where there were five villages, which is why the Spaniards put the bridge there. You know, that way it was easier for them to connect. But they went to these villages and they took the women who were the wives of the uh, known rebels of Connect's uh, rebellion. They The Spaniards put uh, nooses around the women and nooses around the children of these women and threw the women from the bridge and then threw their children from the bridge right below their feet so that the women could see their children um, being executed. 
in response, you know, this act of terror, I mean, they had all the women from, and children from, from the surrounding villages there at the, at the bridge. In response to this act of terror, the women of, uh, the women who were there at this bridge gathered their own children in their arms. and jumped to their deaths into the Usumacinta River. In discussing La Llorona with some people that I know, um, a young man asked me if I remembered that story. He says, that talks about what you're talking about. So that speaks to it. That's what La Llorona is about. I think that um, it needs more of, I, I really think that this topic needs an in-depth feminista treatment. But it really spoke to what I was looking for in terms of that cultural resistance. Traditionally, Native cultures give total respect to women. Um, common advice from Native men to younger Native men is there's only two things in this world you need to bow down to. And that's the woman who takes care of you and God. And as one man told me, he said, and probably if you're smart, you keep it in that order too. The, um, there's this tremendous respect, and that respect comes from the fact that it's women who are the ones who hold the soul. The um, they're the keepers of the hearth. They take care of the hearth, and that is the soul of any home. The syncretism that happened to La Llorona, unfortunately, also happened to uh, the Celtic goddess Bridie, or, you know, later came to be called Bridget, who unfortunately later came to be known as the Banshee. The Banshee, as Bridie, was the goddess of the hearth. Her wailing in the night was the wailing of a woman and child. It wasn't a woman coming to take your soul. Interestingly, as a enduring um, symbol of resistance, during the war of liberation of Sinn Féin against the British, the, um, a candle would, would be kept in the window as protection against Brighty. But really, the candles in the window during the war of liberation of, of Ireland was really a um, sign, an indicator, to the IRA soldiers that this was a place where they would find sanctuary. <laughs> that culture resistance goes hand in hand with political resistance. That spiritual resistance goes hand in hand with political resistance. It's about maintaining and protecting the soul. How do you do that? we tap back into those aspects that still exist. You know, we tap back into the idea of myth is to culture with what energy is to matter. It, the impulse is still there. How do we explore it? We fumble around just like we fumble around when we pray. Um, yeah, I don't have any really nifty Indians, so. Okay, Henry, you want to heckle me now? No, I have nothing. Right. Andres, Peter, muchas gracias. Uh, the time span, like the content that's been covered tonight has been vast. I know the topics that we've covered are many, but I know also that the depth is very deep, deep within these topics and, and content. Um, perhaps that's going to lay the foundation for more pláticas con versos en la Corte Solana.